After that, I would like to tell you what is the explanation for, for the fact that in 1980s it started flourishing the way it is perceived today. And thirdly, what is the link or the association with the State of Israel? What is the threat that is perceived today in the State of Israel? Universal jurisdiction is that the country, any country, can promulgate a law and try a person got is not necessarily linked to it. If a person committed an offense outside that country, is not a citizen or a resident, that country, after it has taken the authority in its internal legislation uh, to put him on trial. When we talk about such a possibility, so what are we talking about? What kind of laws are we referring to? Normally, we talk about uh, three types of crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. The crime of genocide, those are crimes that are called heinous crimes. The international community agrees that those crimes are so flagrant and are so severe that a person should uh, be tried no matter anywhere as long as he's uh, nabbed and he's uh, prosecuted. Uh, the essence of those crimes stem from the fact from historical processes, for example, the Nuremberg trials. The convention that based uh, the uh, war crime, the Nazi war criminals, people who are indicted uh, of war crimes and crimes against humanity that were perpetrated in the Second World War should be adjudicated before an international military court, which is associated by the signatory, which was the England, France, the Soviet Union, the United States that will operate in Nuremberg. It was equally stated that those criminals uh, can be tried even in countries that set up the said court. The con con convention was ratified by 19 other countries in 1946. Its principles were adopted unanimously by the UN uh, General Assembly. It was resolved at the time that uh, crimes against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity are uh, crimes in all those countries, and each country can prosecute the perpetrators. And indeed, as a result of this step, uh, Nazi war criminals were tried in a number of countries, as was mentioned, including the State of Israel. Uh, Eichmann was tried. Uh, but there was a great association because the victims lived in the state of Israel. This needs to be accounted as opposed to what I'm going to talk about later on. Another example that I would like to highlight and show you is that the universal jurisdiction had existed before that and before it broke out in such a serious manner in the 90s, um, the war uh, laws that were expanded in 1949 by four Geneva uh, conventions, uh, those conventions said what is permissible and what is not permissible during the wars and to talk about vi regular violations or flagrant violations with regard to the interdictions, with regard to the fact that the country should look for the perpetrators and try them, even if they did not um, perpetrate the crime in that country, did not refer to it and are not its citizens. The description of those flagrant violations expand the definition of war crimes beyond the Nuremberg trial and, in fact, subjects them. Uh, uh, before the universal jurisdiction. And those examples that I've just cited and many others that I cannot go into uh, due to the brevity of time uh, tell us that universal jurisdiction existed before the 90s as well, at which time there was a series of prosecutions that started in many countries and continues today. Henry Kissinger talks in an article when he, which he wrote in 2001 that in the Within 10 years, we have witnessed that a movement, an unprecedented movement has organized in order to shift uh, international politics into uh, legal procedures. Uh, and this is not, he's not the only one to make this claim. This has expanded uh, rapidly with, and there was no public discussion about it because of the uh, proponent, because the proponents wanted uh, to try the violators of human rights and the perpetrators of other crimes that were mentioned theoretically. When we talk about war crimes or crimes against humanity, this is certainly a worthy cause to try people when, when they committed those crimes. But the way it is done, when you talk about the universal jurisdiction in those countries, it has many pitfalls. Uh, what, what is important uh, to, under, uh, uh, to stress, although there were conventions that determined universal jurisdiction, we, we did not see such activity in, in those countries until the 90s. 
So how this uh, universal jurisdiction uh, burst in the 90s? We need to bear in mind that through the UN Security Council during the 90s, there were two tribunals that were set up um, that wanted to try crimes in certain areas and during certain periods. I'm talking about Yugoslavia and Rwanda. Uh, there were a few other tribunals, but they were set up when the international community thought that, uh, that such crimes are committed in those areas that the perpetrators should be tried. Therefore, the Security Council, based on its jurisdiction, set up those tribunals. In addition, we also saw great activity from 1948 in the Rome Convention. In the Rome Convention, when they talked about the law of ad evidence, namely how to bring single people uh, to try them, it was intimated that it would be highly desirable that other countries would prosecute such criminals. Why? Because the jurisdiction, according to the Rome Convention, was given only to the countries that were ratified it. And we know that many countries did not ratify the Rome Convention. For example, the State of Israel. For example, the United States. For example, Russia. And many other forces that also uh, sit on the Security Councils. That's why the world said, hold on. Uh, we cannot prosecute those people, and we cannot try them. And it is very important that people who do have ju universal jurisdiction would be able to exercise them against those people. The affair, owing to which, uh, by the way, uh, and, and when this trend began of the violation of human rights, we this ball started, the snowball started rolling. And we know when the cannons are firing, the mews are not silent. And then they started saying to build the cases that should be prosecuted in various countries. I would like to relate very briefly to the Pinochet affair. If you recall, it started in 1988 when an extradition order was submitted to England to extradite Pinochet to Spain. We so, the red light has been turned on. From today on, we will start waiting for prosecutions against officers of the State of Israel. It was not long before this happened. So what happened in the Pinochet affair? And I want to look, uh, examine it, and I want to look at the problems of universal jurisdiction. A Spanish uh, judge wanted to bring Pinochet to England so that he would be tried uh, for violations that were perpetrated against uh, Spanish people in Chile. If we look at what happened historically, we know that Pinochet seized power in Chile, brought about a coup against Allende, somebody who was legally elected to be the governor of Chile. What is interesting to recall, however, that uh, many of the Democrats Democratic parties at that time in Chile were very happy about this coup because Allende, when he ruled Chile, he was a, like a Cuban leader. He used the Cuban weaponry. He was not a dictator because he was elected, but he used he used the dictatorial or tyrannical methods, and therefore people did not regret it. But what happened when the junta started operating the way it did? and uh, they went overboard. People start talking about those crimes. The critics say that if the Spanish judge would have been a little bit more sensitive and would remember in Spain the regime of Franco, that after the post-administration of Franco, they gave a national uh, amnesty for bringing criminals to trial in order to stabilize the democratic regime, then perhaps he would not have submitted the extradition demand from England and would enable Chile to cope with that problem in the same way. And in fact, I would like to remind you that in 2000, the Chilean court took, uh, removed the, the immunity of uh, Pinochet, wanted to try him as possible in that state for the crimes he committed. In other words, I'd like to show you the complexity which is dangerous in the universal authority that is given to any state for being a state, no matter how it tries, what are the evidence laws there. 
in order to try people who have no connection to it when it is possible that at the same time we are shutting one eye regarding activities of amnesty or a pardon uh, process before you come to some sort of a solution. It's interesting to note uh, at the moment, although it's not university authority, but in the criminal international law uh, court, when you try to try uh, in Uganda the heads of the rebels, and Uganda keeps uh, going back to the international court, says not to try him, because there's a reconciliation process in Uganda, they want to let Uganda to deal with its own affairs. In other words, if we talk about uh, processes of reconciliation in states, this universal authority where a person comes from another country, it doesn't consider these processes, and that can be very dangerous. I'd like to remind you, for example, the, uh, uh, the court case against uh, Sharon, which is a completely different thing, and I was involved in that. And actually, at that time, uh, I, at the time, I got letters from people who said that they're ready to testify of the activities of Belgium in Congo. Namely, when we bring a person to trial in some state, there's no discourse in the international community what kind of a state it is. And many states that today are democratic have a very dubious past regarding the crimes that they committed at the time. So this is another point that we have to mention when we talk about a universal authority. So if that's the case, that I have another two minutes, then let me uh, skip a large part and let me come to the State of Israel. What is happening today, we see that there's a wave of uh, submitting lawsuits against people or our offices in the IDF. I don't have to remind you. We had the issue of Almog, who sat in a plane in Britain. We had an issue of Mofaz and also Dichter of the... Uh, Shabak. All these uh, decisions are by NGOs that see in Israel a state that violates consistently the uh, uh, laws of war, and it's actually accused of genocide against the uh, Palestinians, things that you can't even fathom, that these are things that there was an intention towards when the laws uh, were actually consolidated. And the danger is that such lawsuits, first of all, they uh, uh, limit the possibilities of people here that they uh, are in war. Of course, if we talk about the wish uh, to uh, commit uh, actions, I don't even uh, war crimes, it doesn't even come into question. But these uh, lawsuits are submitted to courts. Sometimes they have a political agenda because they have the certain attitude against Israel or courts that have no international skills whatsoever. And the great danger is that there's like this uh, downhill, these lawsuits are going to accumulate, and we know that the difficulty is altogether to see what the results are going to be. Now, the difficulty is very great to fight against these lawsuits. What can you do? Because we know that in democratic uh, countries, there's an operating authority and there's a judicial authority. So Israel asking Britain not to do so has no significance because the, uh, executive, branch. the executive. executive branch in England has nothing to do with it. What you can do, you try to have an influence on the various countries to limit or to reduce the universal authority and to create a difference between the people who are indicted and the crimes. Otherwise, we go to a place which is very, very dangerous. Today, we're in a world of human rights, and we want to protect human rights, but we have to do it in a way which is balanced. The way that is dealt today in the universal authority, it's not balanced, and it is a danger, and it also serves as a fighting tool against the State of Israel. I'm sorry I have to stop here, but that's the time I'm allotted. Thank you.